Hi, everybody. Wow, that happened faster than it usually does. Uh, I, I, as we have been mentioning uh, to folks who watch this on the YouTube channel Ace Detect, uh, we have moved channels. Uh, we're reposting for the time being uh, to give you a chance to resubscribe, but uh, go subscribe to the Daily Tech News Show channel at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. If you're watching this on a podcast, I confused the heck out of one poor podcast subscriber. Uh, you're fine. Nothing has changed. So... It's all good. Dan Patterson is here. Hi. Hi. You ready to do a podcast? I'm ready to do a podcast. Look at that. Me too. What a coincidence. Here we go. The following program contains news and information of a technical nature. The program is made possible by the generous support of users like you. Thank you. For information on how to contribute, go to dailytechnewsshow.com. The comments and opinions expressed are those of the program participants who are solely responsible for the content and do not necessarily represent the views of Alpha Geek Radio or the Frog Pants Studios Network. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 2nd, 2015. I'm Todd Merritt. Joining me today, very happy to have UN reporter Dan Patterson on the show. How's it going, Dan? Welcome back. Hey, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you for having me. It's uh, always good to have Dan on. Uh, he's a very experienced journalist, been all around the world. Uh, and uh, you were inspired by a conversation we were having sort of casually about the nature of journalism and online journalism uh, the other day. So we're going to dig a little more into that today. Yeah, it was uh, the show last week and uh, particularly talking about the new models in journalism, which I think is a topic of conversation uh, here in, in uh, New York. Yeah, absolutely. More on that in a moment, but let's start off with the headlines. Microsoft gave us more details on the rollout of Windows 10 in a blog post from Terry Meyerson today. Here's the short version. Not everybody's going to get it on July 29th. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the detailed version. OEM partners, the folks who actually build computers uh, from scratch and buy these in bulk, will get it soon. I don't say exactly when. I imagine the OEM partners know when, though. Uh, that will allow them to start imaging new devices. And then soon after that, retailers will get it so they can prepare for customer support and providing upgrades to folks. And then July 29th, that's the date we all know uh, that Windows insiders will get it. But that's all they're saying, we'll get it on July 29th. If you're part of the insider program, expect to get it. That's what they're saying. Then people who reserved an update... Remember those little pop-ups that came up at the bottom of your screen? If you, if you reserved your update, you'll line up virtually to get it in waves that Meyerson wrote are going to be scaling up after July 29th. If you reserved it, Microsoft will push a notification when you're ready. Or if it doesn't think your computer's specs are up to stuff, uh, it will provide details if your system has issues, uh, including contact information for device makers, et cetera, to help get you ready for the upgrade. Businesses will get it on July 29th, and then volume licensed customers will get it August 1st. See, Dan, perfectly simple. Very, just like Microsoft, very simple, easy to understand. It's part of their tradition. The new Microsoft is not always that new. Uh, this, is the, this is actually part of the fact that Microsoft is turning Windows into a service rather than a, a package. There will be boxed versions of the upgrade, but, but the idea is they want to get you ready for just Windows rolling updates regularly and not having a date where you have to go buy an upgrade and wait for a service pack, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think what they're trying to make sure of is that when you get the upgrade, a, your computer can install it and use it, and B, the server will deliver it, and they won't get swamped with too many people trying to get it at once. That's actually a really interesting point, the delivery of this and how it will go out to consumers. I'd like to see, you know, they use BitTorrent kind of like Blizzard does or how they seed that many uh, uh, operating systems in such a short period of time. Yeah, and it's a free upgrade, so, uh, yeah. you know, it should, be, it should be a little looser. Uh, and a lot of more people will want to get it. I guess the idea here is that the people who are going to complain if they don't get it on July 29th are likely to be the people who would sign up for the Insiders program. So if you're telling them they'll all get it on the July, sure. on July 29th, other folks, you know, just your average user aren't going to be breathlessly waiting on July 29th for their new Windows. They'll be happy whenever it shows up. At least that's the plan. And Gadget reports SEO books, Aaron Wall noticed some Google search ads showing up on a small number of queries on Yahoo. 
Remember, Yahoo has a partnership with Microsoft's Bing. The New York Times actually confirmed the arrangement. It's a, uh, Yahoo calls it a small test and still has their partnership with Microsoft. Uh, it is no longer exclusive, though, so they get to do stuff like this. And their partnership with Microsoft could be terminated in October. Yahoo and Google walked away from a partnership in 2008 after opposition by the U.S. Department of Justice's antitrust division. CNN Money reports that MasterCard will experiment to pay with your face. 500 customers will be able to use the MasterCard phone app to confirm a purchase with either their fingerprint or by staring at the phone's camera and blinking once. The blink is actually meant to prevent someone from using a still image of you to fool it. MasterCard has partnered with most of the major smartphone companies, including Apple, Google, BlackBerry, and Samsung, and they're working on deals with the banks that issue the credit cards to allow this. Uh, if you were lucky enough to be one of the 500, Dan, would you, uh, would you like to pay with your face? I, I feel like I pay with my soul all the time, so the face is not uh, it's not a huge jump. But you know what what's interesting to me is that we we've, we've come so quickly into using biometrics. I, I like this trend. I don't know that I trust necessarily our current implementations of the trend, but I really like it. And this is, I think, something that could. I don't know if it pushes facial recognition into the mainstream, but it makes it a lot more interesting and and part of the conversation at the very least. Yeah, and the idea is to try to find something that will replace the password. insecure PIN and password, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, uh, I know there's at least six of you out there thinking, I'll make an animated GIF that has a blink, and then I'll be able to fool it. Or 3D um, print my face. Yeah, exactly, with, with some little blink... Uh, mechanisms inside. Rhino Security Labs founder Benjamin Caudill has developed a hardware proxy that lets users' IP addresses appear to be up to two and a half miles away, according to Motherboard. The proxy ham is what it's called. It's a Raspberry Pi Wi-Fi card and three Wi-Fi antennas stuffed into a cardboard box. One antenna connects to a public Wi-Fi network and the other two transmit and receive to the user who's located a few miles away, at least a mile away. The idea is to plug it into a hidden corner of a place with public Wi-Fi, maybe a library, maybe a coffee shop. That way the user's IP address is located away from them and they won't even be nearby if someone shows up to find them. Uh, and Dan, uh, you've been in situations where uh, there are people whose lives could depend on this sort of thing. Well, and, and just being generally aware of what networks you're touching, we, we often don't think about this, but being aware of the networks that we touch and then the ability to triangulate your location and generally your, your identity from uh, just your IP address is, is pretty incredible. So I, this is a really, really neat idea. I, I wonder about the implementation of this. I certainly can see the, the consumer and the B2B interest, but I, I always think about security and personal identi identifiable information when it comes to stuff like this. Yeah, and so the idea is that you hide it in a corner. So if somebody uncovers it and unplugs it, then it's not going to work for you anymore. You got to right. make sure it's well hidden. Uh, and the other thing is that just because they can't find your IP address because this thing is obfuscating it doesn't mean they can't find your data in other ways. So you, this is only one part of a program. You're going to want to use a VPN, Tor, etc. Yeah, if you really right. want to keep yourself protected. That's so important, right? It's part of a kit, and uh, this is interesting, but just make sure that the other parts of your kit are uh, implemented. TechCrunch reports Xiaomi announced it has sold 34.7 million smartphones in the first half of 2015. That's up 33% over last year. If you're a fan person of, of Xiaomi, you can just stop listening now. Uh, it's a nice jump, but it's not on pace to hit the 100 million smartphones that CEO and co-founder Lei Jun estimated the company would sell in 2015. Xiaomi began selling phones in Brazil, or will begin, I should say, selling phones in Brazil July 7th. That will help. Second half of the year usually is a bigger sales half than the first half also. Uh, Xiaomi sold 61 million phones in 2014, for example. Uh, so they will probably beat last year's amount, but they're not seeing necessarily the hockey stick growth that they were seeing the first couple of years. It might just be market saturation. Yeah. Uh, and that's why opening up in some place like Brazil is absolutely important to making sure those numbers continue to go up if that's what you want to do as a company. According to multiple sources talking to The Verge, Facebook has held talks with Sony Music Entertainment, Universal Music Group, and Warner Music Group about, quote, getting into music. Maybe they want to start a band. I don't know. Uh, they haven't decided exactly how they would like to get into music yet. Uh, discussions are still in the early stages. Of course, people immediately think, wow, you got 
billion users there, you might want to do a music service and instant uh, domination of the streaming music market. Uh, on the other hand, I think with Facebook's emphasis on video recently, there's a good chance that they want to license uh, music videos and let people uh, post them. They have a deal with Spotify to do some posting right now. So it would make sense for them to go straight to the labels and say, hey, let's make it easier for our users to share music with each other. It would make a ton of sense if for no other reason than they they have to compete with with the other players in the market, and they have to do something. There has to be some kind of response. Facebook just can't sit on their hands and not make these kinds of deals. And it is uh, kind of a no-brainer when it comes to, to content, media content and distribution. Facebook has really performed very well with video, so it makes a lot of sense that they would do the same thing with video music. Yeah, the Verge article implies that they want to do something unique. Uh, so yeah. I wouldn't expect them to just start a Spotify clone. No. Uh, but no. something that maybe solves some of those problems of having multiple services and not having the same music on all of them. Something that solves the discovery problem. That's what Apple's trying to do with Beats 1. I, I would imagine it would be along those lines, don't you? Yeah, and they could take a lot of the intelligence that they've gleaned from, from EdgeRank and the news feed and, and how to present types of information to users at the right time uh, and build, you know, they've also done very well at acquiring and building separate siloed services. So it would, it, it's not a stretch to think that Facebook would build its own or own its own music specific silo. Yeah, it's not impossible. Absolutely. ZDNet reports HP has filed the paperwork uh, with the US SEC regarding the split the company has been planning. Uh, there will be two entities by the end of 2015. HP Inc. will sell PCs and printers, and HP Enterprise will focus on commercial technology with CEO Meg Whitman staying on as the head of HP Enterprise. Engadget reports the United Arab Emirates National Innovation Committee, alongside Winsun Global and a few other companies, plan to use a 20-foot 3D printer to make the parts for an entire office building, including the furniture inside. Winsun Global has already printed a six-story apartment building in China, so they have some experience. Project's going to use special reinforced concrete, fiber reinforced plastic, and glass fiber reinforced gypsum. And they say once they begin, they'll be ready in a few weeks. That last part kills me. Ready in a few yeah. weeks? I, I mean, I can see this being in theory, or we would like to do that. Like, no, it's the next week. Don't worry. Yeah, 2,000 square feet footprint. I don't know how many stories it's going to be. Uh, but So it's not the largest thing, but any, any kind of office still building. still impressive, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. All right, time for some news from you. These come from our subreddit, uh, as do many of the stories, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Uh, if you wonder why did they talk about those stories, well, one reason is we saw folks voting on it over in the subreddit. So get on there and make your voice heard too, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Captain Kipper submitted the Mashable report that Apple's new iCloud music library syncing is not working properly for several users. Uh, tracks are moving on to the wrong albums, album art is being replaced incorrectly, some artists get listed multiple times, and of course all those errors get replicated across all the devices that you've plugged into iCloud Music Library. Apple has also turned off home sharing for phones and tablets in the new version of the iOS. It still works for Apple TV, though. I imagine that's part of their deal with the music labels, but... Uh, it doesn't seem like anytime there's a new cloud service of any kind, it relaunches without bugs, and Apple is not immune to that. Yeah, I mean, we have to manage our expectations. I wouldn't imagine that Apple Music or any new service like this would launch without bugs. I have always uh, been critical of the way iTunes Match works. It tries to do more than it's good at. There are yeah. other matching systems out there that are that err on your side more often. Uh, and Apple seems to err on it, assuming that it's right about things, which can can cause some people to lose music in certain cases, I don't, which I don't like. Don't trust it. I don't trust it. You can trust it if you want. That's a personal decision. Kennedy Style submitted the DSL reports post about Chicago's new 9% cloud taxes. One is the extension of an amusement tax to electronically delivered amusements like Netflix and Spotify. Uh, the other covers non-possessory computer leases or essentially cloud computing, things like Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Service. City requires providers of those kinds of services to begin collecting the tax starting September 1st. So if you are amused in your own house by Netflix and you're in the city of Chicago, mm. there's uh, that's going to cost Netflix a little tax money. This is this has been implemented. Like this is this is it's okay. been passed. Yeah, they huh. start implementing it Crazy. September first. Yeah. Right. That sounds kind of like a regressive tax. If we look at uh, the way 
the cloud is a part of our lives now. It's hard not to be involved in, in using and buying cloud services. That 9% is a heck of a tax. Well, and it's, it's a tax that's put on amusement parks, you know, places with merry-go-rounds and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and they're like, well, wait a minute. People are being amused. I, I mean, <laughs> by, by <Spotify. laughs> what if you're not amused? What if Orange is the New Black is not funny to you? Do you still I have to pay? I refuse to be entertained. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it works that way. I think, in all seriousness, the worrying issue here is not so much about the city of Chicago, but if multiple cities all start doing this, suddenly anybody who starts an online service is going to have to negotiate thousands and thousands of different laws about what taxes they have to pay in the localities that they serve. And, and the Internet is supposed to be worldwide. This is not manageable. Worldwide. <laughs> Always on. Uh, Gold Kick shared this real-life crime th thriller from Ars Technica. Carl Mark Force, we believe that's his real name, uh, he is the head of a Baltimore-based DEA team that investigated the Silk Road drug trafficking website. Uh, it's, uh, you, we should not describe it as a drug trafficking website. It was the Silk Road website. It was accused of enabling people to traffic in drugs. Anyway, uh, Mark Carl Mark Force has pled guilty to extortion, money laundering, and obstruction of justice. Force took payments from Silk Road's Ross Ulbricht that he did not tell his superiors about and diverted the Bitcoins into his personal accounts. He also confiscated money customer customer with 20th Century Fox for a movie without any supervisory approval. Got some money for that. Force is to pay about five hundred thousand dollars, three hundred twenty thousand pounds in restitution, with one hundred fifty thousand dollars of that already being paid sentencing will take place in October. Uh, fascinating. You know, Wired has done some pretty good reporting on this uh, or on, on similar components of the Silk Road story. But the, I mean, really, I just can't wait to see the movie. Yeah. Uh, I get why 20th Century Fox wanted to yeah. pay this guy some money. I mean, his sure. name's Carl Mark Force. <laughs> That's you can't you can't invent a better name than that. Uh, Star Fury Zeta sent us the news that Andre Borsberg, the pilot flying the Solar Impulse 2 aircraft around the world, has officially broken the record for the longest solo flight. It was previously held by Steve Fawcett, who set the world record at 76 hours in 2006. While circumnavigating the globe, mind you, in the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer, uh, Borsberg has only been aloft for more than four days, well, he's been aloft for more than four days, without fuel, because it's solar, since taking off from Nagaya, Japan. Uh, and he's going to land at Kalaeola, Hawaii, on Maui. So he's not going nearly as far as Fawcett did. The trip around the world began in Dubai uh, March 9th, and in, in hops, they're taking this solar plane all the way around the world as well. Just takes a yeah. little longer. Very cool, perfect concept. Yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, re really, really amazing. If you haven't gone and looked at the Solar Impulse website, uh, and, and they're talking to him, he's in the cabin, he's been there for four days, uh, you know, very little sleep because he's the only pilot. It's it's just insane. I was watching it earlier and they're talking to him about the cloud bank that he has to navigate and they want him to get into a holding pattern so he enters it at exactly the right time so they limit the amount of turbulence. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous thing that he's doing and, and yet uh, they're doing it well and they're all doing it to try to prove that solar energy is viable. Very impressive Mr. Borschberg. And that is a look at the headlines. All right, let's talk about, I don't know that anybody's covered this, Dan. Tech is having an effect on journalism. Not, Have you heard of this? One bit. It no. has not been discussed at nauseum. By First all. time, breaking news. Uh, no, obviously, uh, this is being discussed a lot. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's an evolving conversation. And, and Dan's in a, an interesting position in New York to be able to bridge the gap uh, covering technology, but also having a lot of context within uh, the traditional journalism world that doesn't cover technology. Uh, if you go to medium.com and uh, and look at Dan's article, he's got it at medium.com slash Ann at, sorry, at Dan Patterson. Uh, you've got some great quotes from different folks around New York about this particular issue. And one that caught my eye was from a Salima. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter at Salime, S-A-L-I-M-A-Y says that there is a growing uncertainty around the journalism industry, but she says, isn't it the case for all 
technology related businesses. The bad news is the increasing job insecurity and the pressure to deliver high qualities, high volumes of quality journalism fast and cheap. The expectations are very high. The question is, what do you have to offer? And she quotes David Carr, who says, create something with your own dirty little hands. I feel like that neatly sums up the two sides of the argument, which is, hey, this is, there's, the way we're, we've been doing it worked very well, but it's falling apart. And the other side is, well, then you've got to figure out a new way of doing it. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the context around uh, gathering these thoughts from people uh, about the current state of news and media and technology. In that, uh, I, I love the West Coast conversations and we we about technology and journalism. We have kind of parallel conversations here on the East Coast, with a primary theme being, uh, although you know tech is very. Uh, predominant here in New York City, but a primary theme is is that there are the disruptors, and then there are those who have been disrupted. And I've worked on different sides of this coin. I've worked for small news organizations, large news organizations that were disrupted, and and now I work and report with a bunch of young people at the UN who for the most part, report for traditional news organizations, but in this very new and interesting way. And then when we sit around the bar and we have drinks with our media friends here in the city, we'll often talk about, you know, you know, friends will say, should I stay in news and reporting, or should I move over into technology? Should I move over into advertising or media or marketing? And, you know, all of these questions are up in the air and there are no answers for them, but they're conversations that are being had in parallel uh, between the two different coasts. So, you know, I think I think what Salima was saying, uh, and that David Carr quote really sums it up very well, is that, you know, no matter no matter what the models are, you do have to go out and create. And and you know, particularly, you guys had a very interesting conversation last week uh, that that tracked along these lines as well. That although the technology and the platforms may change, uh, the the process of creating doesn't always change, and you still have to go and create that that thing with your dirty little hands. Yeah, a lot of times, especially in the tech press, there seems to be a bit of an attitude of get over it and use the new tools, right? Uh, this is just the way of the world now. Stop whining for an outdated model. And I think that if the, that side of the argument is failing in any way, it's they should be looking at how to make sure that that new model is easier is more easily moved into. I think about yeah. when I was growing up in the 80s, in the late 70s, the, the cry then was newspaper journalism is falling apart because we only have one daily paper now in most cities, right? Like outside of New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, everybody was losing their second or third daily papers. Uh, the difference then was if you lost your job at one of those daily papers that closed, what well, you could go to the daily paper there uh, that was in existence still and try to get a job and say, hey, you know, I'm better than the guys you have. I'm more experienced, et cetera. Or you can move to another town, try to get a job in another newspaper. And those skills were almost 100% transferable. The difference now is you lose your job in a newspaper and the options are work at a blog, uh, do, so, do social networking, create your own, work on a podcast. And those are a lot scarier because those are new skills for a lot of people that they understand the basics of journalism, like you said, the basics of storytelling. But that learning curve of figuring out how to plug those skills into this new way of doing things is daunting. Well, yes. and I'll... hello, I am it. It happened to me. Right, right. <laughs> it's our producer, Jenny Josephson, jumping in because obviously uh, she works here now, but previously worked in, in big media corporations. Yeah. And... Oh, Go, ahead, Go ahead, Jane. No, no, I was just going to say, it's a terrifying adoption for somebody who who was taught the traditional way of, of being a journalist, who felt like maybe that wasn't the way for me, but didn't know where or what to do, who then went to exactly the same company, just a big internet company, you know what I mean? Like, the yeah. same kind of big ship, little rudder. And then having to take all that knowledge and go to a, a unique organization of two people just trying to get it right and learn all these tools, it was terrifying. Like, I didn't want to speak for the first year. So I, I empathize. Yeah. 
I think I I hear exactly what you just said throughout the newsroom and and with most of the people I either know or work with in one way or another. And a, a huge part of the change is you know uh, uh, one reporter that I work with. Uh, she's Restless Ronnie on Twitter, and I put her in this news post as well. Uh, oh, incidentally, there's an easy to remember Bitly. It's just bitly.com/newsthoughts. Uh, it will take you there. But you know she made a really good point that a lot of it. Okay, there there's the mastering the technology, but there's there's also the mastering of the business model, and you have to, for the first time, a lot of people have to be either conscious of the business that, of the content they're creating, or constantly shopping for new new places to publish. And I think a lot of the people that I work with, at least in the UN newsroom, are really hardworking, smart, expert journalists, but they're constantly on the hustle looking for a new place to sell something. And when you have to manage your money. And the new technology at the same time—that's beyond daunting. And Salima said this uh, later on in that post that you quoted. Uh, in numerous other, in, like in numerous other industries, journalists and specifically freelancers have to develop their own style, expertise, and entrepreneur skills. Yeah. Your portfolio of strengths will need to be constantly updated, and it is as exciting as it is daunting. Absolutely. I can I can another great example. So I I was at ABC News for a, a number of years, and when Twitter happened, I I grabbed the URL at ABC News, and then promptly got yelled at by standards and practices and the rest of the news. This was like 2008, maybe it was a while ago, and and the older newsroom kind of scowled and said, "Oh, what are you trying to to." mess around with this new media. I mean, it was really like, what are you doing messing around with this new media thing? Now, they finally they figured it out and came around, but a lot of them in the process were laid off, took different jobs, or had to adapt to things where I get technology's argument in saying, you know, look, you have to adapt, you have to change. But when you've built your career doing something and you're really good at it, I can really understand looking at the bratty face of me or younger people and saying, who the hell are you telling me what to do? Who are you telling me to change? I know how to do this really, really well. Why do I have to change? And it's, I under, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but I can understand the older guard feeling that and thinking that. And I've heard that same complaint from musicians. Uh, when, yeah. when, yep. when you talk to musicians, and, and some musicians are saying, you just have to get out there and, and connect with your fans and do more concerts and do more merch. And some musicians are saying, no, but that's not why I got into music. I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to have to worry about t-shirt right. sales. I just want to make music. And the old studio system makes that happen. So I want to preserve that. Uh, and, and that's not an excuse to preserve the old system, but you do have to countenance those arguments and take them into account. And, and to bring it back to journalism, when, when technology companies sort of dismissively say, well, you just need to learn the new stuff, that's easy to say for the technology company yeah. that has spent 10, 15 years, all of its employees just natively growing up learning to use this new stuff versus someone who hasn't touched it. And it's, and it's, and it's frightening. And the people who could help you understand it are just telling you to go do it yourself. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and I, blog. I think, yeah, and I think the excellent example is what happened in, you know, 2008, 2009, when uh, at first you had journalists in newsrooms that I worked in uh, basically being like, oh, we're not allowed to tweet. We're not allowed to tweet. And then all yeah. of a sudden it was, everybody yeah. wants us to tweet. Right. And then you tweeted one thing and somebody from Standards and Practices yelled at you about what you tweeted and then you had to put a thing in your little bio that says, retweets are not endorsed. Right. And it's like, come on, either we have, and this is something that BioCow brought up and this is so important, is that either we are, we have opinions and we try to be fair, right? Or we don't say anything at all where this crazy objective standard, but really what it comes down to is this thing that in our chat room, BioCal said, he said he thinks it's the difference between one-way communication and two-way communication, which is like for a long time, media was just push it out. And yeah, maybe you got an angry letter in the mail or in the age of internet, you got comments, but now it's such a huge back and forth that that's the terrifying thing is actually yeah. interacting with the people who are consuming your storytelling. You're so right. And you know, a big part, uh, I can talk totally understand where, I'm just using them as an example, but a lot of traditional media companies are like this, where ABC would freak out. You know, it's not freak out, but have consternation and have issues. Particularly, you know, while I was there, the president, David Weston, quit and said, I can't run a news company that is run by lawyers. And 
I understand that that over time, news organizations, you know, particularly the one that credentials me right now, they get sued, and they get sued for all kinds of reasons. And I understand why over time they become more and more cautious, more litigious, and more they just lawyer up and say, you know, we can't risk getting sued. We don't want some kid out there saying something stupid on the internet and getting us sued or yeah. sex tapes. <laughs> well, and, yeah, right. Uh, and one of one of the reactions in the past was to ring fence yourself, right? Yeah, uh, and right. that's the impulse that Jenny's saying, which is just don't say anything. Let's be very circumspect about what we do say, which I think degrades journalism to a certain extent because it doesn't allow you to shed light on parts of a story that help understanding. What the internet is scariest for journalism is that it could improve it in that way it, but in a way that can cause huge risks to have to be taken, as as Dan is alluding to, right? Or the right? loss of jobs when you don't yeah. do your job up to the standard or you get hornswoggled or well, whatever Well, even beyond is. that, just companies yeah. saying, look, we can't get away with being safe anymore because the audience will revolt. And we'll yeah. see it on yeah. Twitter and other right. people will see it. But we also have to not go over the line or we'll get sued out of existence. You're right. right. Our business. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, our business model is predicated upon doing something that may cause us to get sued at some point. Th those two are at odds. And, and it used to be f perfectly safe to offend your audience, right? Because like you said, you might get a letter, but nobody would really see it unless you yeah. decided to print it. Uh, so there was less risk. Now there's just as much risk to go that direction as there is to go the other direction. People will start to say, well, wait a minute, why aren't you reporting on this? Or why didn't you use this quote? I see this quote being used over here. There is a huge fact-checking mechanism going on, and it doesn't always work very efficiently or even fairly. But I think that, to me, is the bigger effect on journalism than, than just business models and, and, and the day-to-day the -day operation of it. So that being said, I wouldn't want this discussion to conclude, and it may not conclude, without talking about the amazing impact that technology has had on journalism. Because I'm sitting here thinking about, um, for example, Periscope, okay? Like, we have not yet had the big story that makes Periscope, but it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before whatever the huge breaking news story of the of the moment is uh, is covered from every single angle by everyone with a smartphone. Well, there was an explosion in New York City yeah, that was covered on Periscope. Was it wasn't as huge as you're talking about, but yeah, we've a, already seen the. I guess you could call it the pre-tremor pre of the. Of the I would yeah. agree. That, that was like the one that wakes everybody up and makes them check their earthquake kit. But I'm talking about like it, it really missed the protests in Baltimore by a couple of weeks. That's the the wild thing and then it's going to happen and then the other thing is you know stuff like um interlude right the the company that makes interactive videos it's like if there's a company like an old media company that has 800 years of tape sitting in their archive and you're given a way to interact with that video like that's an incredible opportunity what about that i mean i know there's a lot of downside to this whole change but i, I wouldn't want to get away with the fact that there is a huge upside if if yeah, these you're right. are nimble enough to harness it. And it's ultimately a net positive. It's just the the mechanics of getting there have there's collateral damage, but you're absolutely right that that you know, it I think what you're saying like per, we're waiting for Periscope's occupy mo moment or its Ferguson moment where we really see the tools uh, put to the test, but I think arguably we we've seen that for quite a while. We see that now, you know, I think the advent of podcasting and Twitter a decade ago, I think, really foretold the future that we're living in now. And and it is, I I hope it's the hope of places like Medium and other other new types of publishers that really look after not just publishing content from experienced content creators, but monetizing that content as well. Yeah, you're right. The Periscope is the latest in a parade of new tools. Uh, that have been widening the scope. Uh, and then there are things like Storify, which I think yeah. provide an example of how this new world starts to improve things, right? We realize, well, wait a minute, when everybody can report on Twitter and YouTube and now Periscope, how do we know what's real? How do we how do, we do responsible verification? Yes. Well, you have a company like Storify step in and say, well, we think we know how to do that. Uh, we'll provide that service. Storyful. And it, and, once in, in that instance, Storyful. Storify is the one. I keep saying Storyfy. 
Yeah, store of full is the one. Story full is the one that verifies YouTube's, and store of fi is the one that gets your tweets all in a line. <laughs> okay, story full. I apologize for getting that wrong. Uh, story full is is the one that works with. Is it story full though? Is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I worked uh, with them at C at uh, at Yahoo, and they. That's Got their it. job. Is they yeah, there's one L. That's why I couldn't find yeah, it. It's, I got they're a fascinating time. company. I used to call them Storify to their face. Like. Storyful, and my apologies to the folks at Storyful uh, for, for doing what has been done to you millions of times, I'm sure. Uh, it's like when somebody calls Mike a Mike. Uh, Storyful, anyway, not to get bogged down in that, is an example of we, we can actually, we will end up with better journalism, in my opinion once this is all shaken out than we had before. Uh, because you won't be able to obfuscate. You won't be able to hide as many things. I'm not saying it'll be perfect, but we have more eyes and we have verification uh, and we have the ability to really understand stories in ways that we never could before. And we have people empowered to be the journalists in their own lives. And to me, that's the amazing part of this, is that there is a way now for voices that aren't always heard to be heard. And, and it's not perfect, and it doesn't come in a nice little two-minute package on TV, but it's going to get there. And I, I, I'm really ex I am excited about the future of journalism. Dan, have we convinced you to be excited about the future of journalism? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, always, always. It's always exciting. It's tumultuous, but it's always exciting. Our pick of the day comes from Hot Branch in sunny Jazz Festi Montreal, who says he was listening to DTNS 2527 about the discuss of the state of modern radio and the lack of locally produced curated music reminded him of Bill Fitzhugh's book, Radio Activity, where a classic rock DJ unwittingly becomes an amateur investigator. It's a novel. Uh, he says, in addition to being fun, witty, whodunit, there's a cornucopia of incredibly well-researched musical references. You can find a print copy, uh, although it'll require hunting through a few used bookstores and yard sales, but the Kindle version is available at Amazon. Fitzhugh is one of my favorite authors, says Hot Branch, because he re regularly weaves music references and absurdist humor into a solid and entertaining story let's check that out i would also uh recommend year zero uh mm. as well by rob, rob rob reed uh the same sort of thing telling a a modern technological story in that case and weaving in all kinds of great music references in fact he has playlists and i think he has them on spotify that you can subscribe to and play while you're reading the book uh, so thank you hot branch for sending that in you can send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Got one message of the day from Nickelbacker Matt Aspinall in Having a Mini Heatwave, York, England. Following our discussion of Beats 1, he thought he'd give it a try during his morning train commute and discovered something amazing. When they went through the tunnel and lost phone service, the music continued seamlessly. It seems the song's pre-buffer so that if you lose your data connection, so long as you pick it back up before the song ends, the station is uninterrupted. It, uh, it, he said, I have to admit, this is a really cool thing that BBC radio stations normally that I normally listen to can't do. I tested the iPlayer radio app and found it's better at this than I remember, but it cuts out briefly when rejoining the live stream, whereas Beats 1 didn't. Interestingly, you can lose your data connection while the presenter on Beats 1 is talking and you'll still get a seamless experience. So I guess the station isn't as live as they keep saying. Uh, but that, that is pretty cool that they buffer like that. And you're right. It's not live, live. You're not hearing it as the person is speaking on the internet because of buffering and lag and whatever. You probably never would anyway. So why not give it a little five minute delay in there? As radio is anyway. Yeah. I did hear uh, a mistake earlier today where the, the presenter uh, introed the wrong song. And then Eileen and I looked at each other and we're like, that was the song she just played. That's not the, the song she's playing now. And then she came back on and was like, oops, my mistake, and fixed it. So they are at least pretending it's live. They're not going back and fixing things like that. Have you been listening to Beats 1, Dan? I have. Uh, I, I've tried almost every streaming service and been a pretty lo loyal RDO subscriber for the last several years. But uh, uh, for a number of reasons, tried Spotify and Google and, and now Apple Music. And I have to say, Apple Music, it's not perfect, uh, but I, I'm sticking with it. I really love the live radio aspect. It, it reminds me of... I mean, some of the DJs are a little cheesy, but uh, it, it reminds me of that 
connected feeling. Look, radio is not about the music itself. It's about that package of the hour or three hours or whatever you're spending with the DJ. And if it can be a little AOR, uh, then, then it can be kind of fun and you can hear quirks. And it's about the fact that many people are consuming the same piece of culture, hopefully localized at the same time. So because yeah. of that, I dig it. I'm fascinated with it. Uh, I, I, the idea of one radio station to rule them all has always fascinated me. It, it can't be done, but I love the attempts to say, well, this is going to be not about a format, not about a genre. This is going to be just about music. Uh, it's, it's almost a, a, a Don Quixote type <laughs> expedition, uh, but it really is interesting to watch, I think. Uh, well, Jenny Josephson, thank you for popping in and sharing your experience with us, as always. Uh, you can yeah. find Jenny on the Twitters at twitter.com slash JennyJ23 and go listen to Tell It Anyway if you want more great storytelling. Uh, that's what all journalism is about. It's about storytelling. Tellitanyway.com are, is people sitting around and Jenny gets them to tell these amazing stories. I don't know how you do it. I don't know either. Every time we start, I think, oh, God, this is going to be the one that doesn't go. And, and people always amaze you with what they have to say. So stay tuned for ones about that time uh, we really stepped in it this weekend. Go uh, check out Dan Patterson as well, twitter.com slash Dan Patterson or danpatterson.com. Uh, you've always got something incredibly interesting and compelling going on. Do you, do you have anything to tell folks about this time? Well, likewise, Tom, and it's always fun to listen to and be on the show. Um, we are uh, building some interesting things uh, with the, the Gawker podcast team. Uh, I think we're doing a little thing just called the news, but I don't know how close we are to talking about that. Otherwise, I'm at the UN a couple of days a week, not working for the UN, but with my uh, other colleagues in that Medium post uh, reporting on the UN and, and uh, weird world issues that are weird. And that's medium.com slash at Dan Patterson, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, my website, danpatterson.com, has everything going has on too. there. But okay. uh, yeah, yeah, we'll soon be the news.fm, I think. All right, keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, thanks to our patrons. I know we had a little uh, hiccup with some of you uh, through Patreon, uh, but Patreon assures me that they're working on uh, fixing all of that. A lot of you have said it's fixed already, so I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but Patreon has been very responsive. They've been great. Uh, so I hope you will continue to support our show through them, patreon.com slash acedetect. However, if you don't, we do offer the PayPal way as well, and a lot of people take advantage of that. Uh, you can find all the ways to support the show at dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. And we are eternally grateful to any of you for supporting us in any amount, uh, even if it's just telling folks about the show. Uh, when you see them in person, on Twitter, or wherever, uh, we truly, truly appreciate because we exist because you want us to. So the more you want us to, the more we exist. <laughs> Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-592-2459. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, player.alphageekradio.com. And visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. It's the holiday in the U.S. tomorrow, so headlines only back on Monday with Veronica Belmont. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Great conversation, uh, Excellent. Dan, as always. Thank show. you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. That was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. What should we call this particular episode? Mm. <laughs> I'm a big fan of my face is my passport. Authorize me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually so, love that. Yeah. It's so great. Uh, I do also like the poetry of tilting at cloud services. Ah, And yeah. then, oh, my God, flying by the sun of our pants. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I think my face is my passport authorized Ooh, me. One blink for yes. Mm. I like that. That's because it's a Star Trek reference. Ah, uh, right. Time to Facebook the music. Oh, I just I got welcomed to Apple Music. Oh. Really? You just emailing me now? I haven't gotten Welcome. mine yet. I thought I was already on it. <laughs> it seemed to be working. Do you think the Apple's emails go out the same way that all of our old company emails used to do? Just like, oh, yeah, staggered. Oh, yeah. Oh, one at a time to like a bazillion people. Mm. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 17 years, I look forward to getting my email about Apple Music. Yeah. Um, 
All right, let's see. I'm trying to see if there are any deep cuts floating around here. Uh, let's see if there are any newsy one. Netflix streams one of yours to the internet. You send one of his to the tax man. That's the Chicago way. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's an Untouchables reference. God, that's Are you being great. amused? Am I a joke to you? Am I a joke to you? <laughs> Never stop. Don't stop. Never stop. Um, sorry. <laughs> Matt Do does I that all the time. You? Uh, uh, yes, uh, any... thank you guys. I'm uh, going to duck off, but I appreciate it. Sure. it uh, all right, yeah, no, wor no worries, Dan. Thanks That's again awesome. for hanging out. Cool, thanks. So, uh, well. See you in the future. Goodbye. Absolutely. I'm leaning towards my face is my passport. I mean, it's just, gosh. It has poetry. Yeah. Oh, I totally missed this story. Yeah. Which story? No, it's uh, a VW robot in Germany picked up a, a human worker and crushed him. <laughs> I Killed saw him. that. It's not the first time it's happened. That's not. And it, it seems as if apparently the, the worker was in an area of the factory floor he was not supposed to be in. It's very sad. I don't think it's a tech story. If you want to know the first time that someone was ever killed by a robot, mm. it's, it's horrible. I should do that. Uh, but yeah, I, I do know that because it's the same day as the anniversary of the invention of the word robot. Hmm. That seems awfully planned. <laughs> Coincidence? I just thought I would throw in some, some nice fresh conspiracy theory there. Right, right. Um, I don't know why. I must be optimism of, optimistic about journalism because I'm not really in it anymore. <laughs> I don't think that makes a huge difference, it. right? I, I totally get if you're at a paper and you're like worried about you losing your job every moment and you can tell that the people in charge don't know what they're doing and are casting yeah. about for a direction, you're going to have a very negative view of journalism right now. I totally understand that. And how I feel even about this show, and you know, you're very clear that you're doing excellent analysis, but we're not doing a lot of firsthand reporting no, because absolutely we're not. shining a light on other people's reporting. But just the ability to communicate with people, the tools that are available make me into a huge optimist, and I, I feel great about it. Um, but I, I don't yeah, think it's it feels just, good. Is it, is it in its uh, prime or its easiest moment? It's, it's probably harder than it ever was because of figuring out where it should go. But once we figure out where it should go and how it gets put yeah. to, back together, it will be easier and better than ever is my, my thought. Yeah. I, um, uh, maybe I just feel good because I have 5,556 bosses who, who, who help us out. <laughs> who understand me. They understand us. Thank you, bosses. Um, although I just went to Patreon and it says, uh, please update my payment information so my creators are supported. <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, I hope that's not one of the bugs. I hope that's just true. <laughs> no, let's see. Retry. Do, 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 do. Boy. All right, I'm gonna let that be for a second. Yeah, don't worry. It's about all right. It. I'm just paying your show anyway. <laughs> well, you, you, that's just. I mean, I know you do it so that you can see the emails, uh, but they need to come up with multiple no, I, account holders so we don't have to do it that way. Yeah, but they. All, I also do it because I want to be a co EP with all the co EPs. Well, but you already outranked them. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Not on the live stream. Yeah. No, uh, don't say that. I don't outrank them. Uh, um, but, uh, sort of. I, well, whatever. <laughs> um, you already have a, a title is what I'm saying. I have a title. Um, but what I'm saying is uh, I want to be symbolically part of their community mm -hmm. of gotcha. people who care enough that about the show to pay $10 a month for it. And I know we <laughs> Which have... I give back to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... But I don't know it. That's it works genius. for me. Huh. Interesting. Work. Hey, Roger, you should put your bio on our page. Okay. We have an work. about 
page, you should put your bio there. Hey, Roger, can we get a bio from you to put on our page? And then can you yeah. give that bio to yourself? And then can you put it on our page? <laughs> All right. Well, I, I would probably just link to the Bible and say the book of Genesis. But I'll write something a little more. Roger is a human. I was born of clay. I was born, I was born clay. Clay, 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 clay. Um, let's see what else is going on. What's going on today? We got a three-day weekend in the I United wish. States. I wish. You know what I remembered? Like, fortunately, in time, I'm subbing for someone's class. So all the Friday, I thought I was going to have, or I was just going to wake up late. How do they have class on a holiday on the most on the Mason's birthday well, celebrated? Well, because Friday is technically not the day. Whatever. I know. That's the American way: is to shift days around so that you can have them off. So I guess I'll be celebrating my pre-independence by talking about independent media on the web. So that's Aha. not terrible. Is it the same? Is it kind of the same course that, or is it like? It's uh, in the documentary side this side this time. So. So uh, wait, you're yeah. subbing. Yep. Because someone else wanted to take that day off. Yes. Which is Independence Day. But. I got someone to fill in for me on Nerdtacular Day, so I'm cool with it. Karmically, all right. yeah, we're all cool. I guess that cool. makes sense. Uh, You're like three little Fonzies. Yep. Right. What? <laughs> you ever seen Pulp Fiction? <laughs> I've seen bits of it. We're all like I three little Fonzies, Roger. What does Fonzie say? Yeah. Hey. What does Fonzie say, Roger? He says, hey. <laughs> he says, sit on it. That's why I, I always wanted the, uh, was it Honey Bunny that says it? He's cool. Yeah. What is Fonzie? It's cool. You know, I, I I think this is the first time I will admit this, but I am not a big Tarantino movie fan. But you've seen Pulp Fiction, right? I've seen it in so much that it was on wow. TV and I left it and then I went up to grab like food, drinks and so I had it on. I didn't really pay attention. I did pay attention. Unsubscribe. To the... Unsubscribe. <laughs> She's I'm unsubscribing sorry. to you, Roger. <laughs> Okay. No, I will agree with you that while early Tarantino is revelatory, later Tarantino is getting a little referentially proud of itself. I thought it basically, well, what's the joke? It just shows you, it just shows you all the trivia he stored by working his previous job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this that reminded me. Uh, the unsubscribe reminded me of well, the one year at the podcast expo. When it was in Ontario, California, and uh, therefore was I was staying at the Double Tree next to the Ontario Convention Center, I was trying to go to sleep, and some rousty podcasters were having a rousing conversation uh, next to me, and I could tell, I could hear their conversation, I could tell they were podcasters, and they're talking about impressions and stuff, and the internet, uh, and so I wrote on a blank piece of paper, unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and shoved it under their door, That's feeling awesome. that that would be a more like in the spirit of the world. Oh, yeah. uh, and then I went back into my room and they, I heard them discover it. And then they were like, does that say unsubscribe? And then they said some sna snotty things and then they quieted down. Yep. That is a nice way to do it. I like that. And I wonder if they're listening right now. Mm -hmm. Or if they all pod faded and became accountants. Or they have an accounting podcast. And if they do, <laughs> you should subscribe. Um, I was about to say, if you do, let me know, because I'm always looking for a good accountant. But our accountant right now is great. Great. So I'm actually pretty happy. Finally. Man, that was a long journey through the desert. Mm. It's hard to find good help. Mm -hmm. Accounting. Sorry, I'm, I'm typing something. All right. My face is my passport. Authorize me. Authorize me. I feel like that's from a movie. Oh, yeah. I can't, I can't tell you which one it's from, but I know I that's a line from a movie. It's my passport. Um, TVZ Con, what's the movie? Oh, no, it's my voice is my passport. Authorize me. No? All right, I'm going to wait 40 seconds. Instead of keeping to guess, I'm going to wait 40 seconds for... Do, 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 do. 
That's all I can safely sing. Yep. <laughs> you were one beat away from getting sued by Alex Trebek. Thank you. <laughs> my face is my passport, most dread. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, that's the face is, of Bo. How long has Alex Trebek been at that job? What, 30, 40? A thousand years. I've always wondered as kind of a exercise, if they were like suddenly that show ended, like what would they do next? Would someone give them the opportunity to host oh, a new oh, game? Oh, Drew Carey would take care of it. <laughs> Sneakers. Thank you. Thank you, Todd Whitehead. That's what it was. Oh. Verify me. I got the I got the Untouchables one only because we watched that recently again. Uh, never no. stop! Don't stop! I have no news. Hey, look! I think I published the pa the uh, the passport. I think passport. I published the passport properly. I am out of the post now. Okay. Okay. Okay, fine. Anyway. Uh, well, I, I feel like, you know, since it's only going to be a headline show tomorrow, I feel reluctant to leave. No. I'm sad. Did, um, did we? I know. I feel like I wrote an email to Darren and Len saying there wasn't going to be one, or did we just tell them on the stream, and should I write them another email? You should, should check to make sure you no, I wrote them. I wrote it to them. Oh, you did. Oh. Hello, oh. Friday folk. The entire company voted and decided okay. we should have Friday off. So yeah, so on. then... Okay. I, yeah. So if Darren shows up and is like, hey, I'm here, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. No, absolutely not. It just means he's awesome. I guess, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to write a reminder, would it? Well, you just... I wrote it. Okay. Len knows. And if Darren shows up, then he'll do what he did the last time and join the headlines show. Roger's not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I know. I could try um, it. January 25th, 1979, Robert Williams was killed on the job in a Flat Rock, Michigan casting plant, becoming the first recorded human death by robot. That we know of. January 25th, 1921, a play called Rossum's Universal Robots by Carol Kepik debuted at the National Theater in Prague. It was the first appearance of the word robot. robot. It's at Czech, the right? end of the play, spoiler alert, at the end of the play, the robots kill all the humans. But one. It's, uh... Yeah, check. I think you're right. It's in Prague, so one would expect it to be there. Prague. I wrote it that way. I remember I wrote it that way because it said Prague, Czechoslovakia. And I'm like, A, in 1921, I'm not sure it was Czechoslovakia, but it might have been. But B, it's not Czechoslovakia anymore, but it would be wrong to say Czech Republic. So I'm just going to not engage and yeah. just say Prague. That's one of those things where it takes a whole sentence to describe the thing you're talking about. Right, and so you just like, leave it out. The country formerly known as Czechoslovakia, which prior to that was known as maybe part of Prussia, but we're not really sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, 1918 is when Czechoslovakia was formed, so yeah. it would have been Czechoslovakia. So it would have been accurate to write Prague, Czechoslovakia, because it's accurate for that year, but yeah. Mm, but uh, TV Zegon uh, asks a pertinent question. What time are the headlines going to be recorded tomorrow? Hmm. I have the right to record them whenever I want. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably do. I'll probably do it at one thirty, unless Eileen says, "Hey, I want to go do this thing," and that means we won't be home at one thirty. In which case, I might do it earlier. But uh, I'll probably be shooting for one thirty. Hmm. Um, I will probably not be involved at all. Is that okay? Because I'll be teaching apparently. That I oh no! Yeah, no. Okay. Neither one of you should be. It's okay. just going to be me recording, and the only reason it is because. I am going to be sitting at this rig anyway, so yeah. why not? All right. I know. I just feel weirdly but, bad when a show comes out and I haven't been involved in it. It's so. my time alone with the audience. <laughs> you know, it's quality. Fair. And they so, all make references to stuff. And I gotta go look it up. Um, robata. Robata is a Czech word, and it means surf labor. Hmm. Robota. Yeah. Robota means a worker. Uh, uh, Robotnik, all of that, yeah. Uh, Robota is uh, is Russian for work, as well. So, what do they call robots in so Russian? The robots. Is it Again? still the same? Like what? For for Robot? the work? I don't know. Robotnik. 
Oh, I'm hearing audio. I hate autoplay. Research. What is robe in Russian? Yeah, I don't know that one off the top of my head. It is robot. <laughs> I think. Uh, Aftopilot. That's autopilot. Aftopilot. Okay. Okay, Derek Chen wrote me a note, very nice note, explaining that when I buy something and I get auto-retargeted to buy the same thing, that that's a mistake. That's a company not doing it very well. Amazon right. is apparently commonly known for that. But, and then this, I guess, this is Amazon. I bought Station Eleven a few days ago because that's the book this month on Sword and Laser. And here I have an ad to buy Station Eleven. Yeah, that happens to me a lot with Amazon, and I hate it. Well, you know, really, the, you know, put on a, turn on an ad blocker or a, or a script blocker and you won't have to live in that world. Mm -hmm. I get it. I like to at least run one browser the way the world sees it so that I don't become an elitist. Mm -hmm. hmm. Maria from Sesame Street is retiring. I know. Well deserved. Well deserved. She's been Maria since ni almost my whole life, since yeah. 1971. Thanks, that's, Maria. It's uh, a long time. <laughs> my friend, the union organizer, I tweeted a really nice, sappy, like, oh, Maria, you know, well deserved retirement. <laughs> my friend, the union organizer, responded to me on Twitter. is like, man, PBS must have a horrible retirement package. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> she had to wait that long. To retire. Or maybe she thought of the, her audience and not for her own good. Oh, sure, Roger. Just take the side of the man. Not the In man. In this case, Luis. Hey, man. <laughs> hey, you know what? It's not to be too glib about the whole thing, but one of the things I remember about unions was that one of the first, the first organized union in America's original um, first act was to basically get Congress to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act. So I'm a little... So, so you, no. you don't like that part of no. the history? No, I wouldn't expect. So. Mm. But you do like a 40-hour work week, don't you? I do. I have, I have no gripes against some... <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hit and miss. It's all... Yeah. The, th the thing is, you can't, you can't really separate it as in a black and white. There are right. things change and attitudes change and things change. Well, this show is going to change, but that doesn't mean you have to change the channel. Uh, if you're watching DiamondClub.tv, for instance, stay tuned for the Gizwiz show with OMG Chad and Dick DiBartolo immediately following the new Quentin Tarantino game show. Name that reference. <laughs>